Well, aloha, everyone. I'm here in Honolulu at the Makiki Cemetery. I live just up the road, uh, right next to Halinani Rehabilitation Center. I told my wife when we moved in some years ago that this was a great place to be because after we live in the condo, then I need to move on. I can go into the nursing home, and then when my time there is done, I can always come on down the road to here to the cemetery. But I'm here today at the cemetery as a reminder that without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, friends, this is all there is. This is all there is, but because Jesus is alive, everything changes. Everything changes. And that was made vivid to me many years ago. I grew up on a neighbor island of Kauai. It's about 100 miles northwest here of Oahu. And if we flew over there today and drove north from the airport in Lahui, about 10 miles or so to Kapa'a, there's a cemetery there that's on the north side of Kapa, beautiful setting, right next to the water, sweeping view of the ocean, magnificent grotto, uh, just amazing. And this grotto, on top of the grotto, there's a cross with Jesus on the cross, and then in the grotto, there's a life-size coffin. For many years in the grotto, there was this life-size coffin that had a cover of plexiglass, and when you looked in that coffin, there was the dead body of Jesus. And I tell you, friends, it was pretty eerie, very creepy. Now, I happened to visit there in 2008 and found that there was a, the, uh, the statue of Jesus had been stolen, the life-size one, so there was a small one, so it wasn't quite the same. But to see that dead body of Jesus was very, very eerie, very, very creepy, friends. And the, the truth of the matter is, if Jesus is dead, then his resurrection did not happen. You know, what are the implications? Paul lets us know about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'd like to share that passage with you. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. And Paul writes from verse 12 and we read through verse 20. He says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Verse 15, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So, if Jesus is not raised, then the resurrection has not happened. And, you know, we have a problem. And what are the implications of that? Paul tells us that, number one, our faith is useless. It's pointless. Number two, we're false witnesses. We don't have a, a legitimate gospel to share. There's no hope. Number three, we're still in our sin. We don't have a savior if he died upon the cross and is still in the grave. And number four, if there's no resurrection, then there's no life after this life. Life ends in death. This is all there is. There's no heaven. There's no future. There's no eternity. We might as well eat, drink, and be married for tomorrow we die. Keith Richards was a member, is a longtime member of the Rolling Stones. Uh, he's a rock icon, a top 10 guitarist, well known for not only his music, but also for his hard living, uh, taking many drugs. And in 2007, he revealed that the, the strangest thing he ever snorted was his dad's ashes. His dad's ashes, yeah, his dad was cremated. And he said, Afterwards, that uh, it was okay because his dad wouldn't care and it went down easy. See, if there's no resurrection, if there's no future, if there's no savior, hey, what's the point? Might as well do whatever you want, baby. But Paul declares, verse 20, Christ is indeed risen from the dead. He is, we serve a risen savior, friends. We have a living Lord. And that is so important that it has been there have been all kinds of attempts to discredit that recently and throughout these last 2,000 years. Conspiracy theories go all the way back 
to the time of Christ's crucifixion, Matthew and his resurrection. Matthew tells about that in Matthew 28. He reveals that the soldiers at the time, the soldiers who were guarding the tomb, were paid a sum of money to spread the story that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus. Now, that theory has problems on all different levels. Number one, the soldiers sleeping, that's a little hard to believe because at that time, if you had a prisoner, if you're a Roman soldier, you had a prisoner, and that prisoner escaped, then it was your life for that life. And so I don't think they'd want to take that chance. Number two, the disciples were too terrified to come up with a scheme to steal the body. They were petrified. They were hiding behind locked doors, facing the soldiers at the tomb. Not going to happen. That would have been impossible. In fact, I love the 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 key piece of evidence that we see in John chapter 20, that there is the folded napkin. Now, if the disciples somehow came up with the nerve, somehow were able to overcome the, the uh, Roman soldiers and roll the stone away, do you think they would have taken time to fold that napkin? Can you imagine somebody saying, hey, Peter, what are you still doing in the tomb? We got to get out of here. Oh, I'm folding the napkin. They said, no, we got we to gotta go. Well, that was God's sign that it was a divine miracle. Not only that, all the religious officials had to do to produce was to be to produce a body and Christian Christianity would have been stillborn. It would have been dead right from the beginning and that would have that would have taken care of that cover-up. But there was no body to produce. Why? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He is alive. He's alive today. There's We can have victory over in our living today. We have hope for all eternity uh, in heaven. And I'm thankful that we have a Savior, friends, that we serve that who is alive. We serve a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And the resurrection changes everything. So what difference does it make? I want to share four things with you. But first, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, ask that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts to receive your word in Jesus' name and that your blessing and glory and anointing would fall upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Open our hearts and fill our lives with joy because of the resurrection. And uh, may our lives change as a result of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. The resurrection proves the reality of our belief, friends. It proves the reality of our belief. Now, what is our belief? The Bible tells us that Jesus broke the power of sin by conquering death when he died upon the cross and proved it by his glorious resurrection. Now, death was Satan's ultimate stronghold. Not only spiritual death, but also physical death. Eventually, everyone would be captured by death. Satan didn't even have to run after you. All he had to do is wait at the grave, wait at your grave, because you're going to wind up there eventually. Whether you were old or whether you're young, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're educated or not educated, whether you are healthy or not healthy, uh, coronavirus, whatever. You could run, but you couldn't hide. Death was a curse on mankind since the first sin and disobedience in the garden, friends. But the good news is Jesus, because of his work on the cross and because of his resurrection, he defeated death and the grave. He broke the power of sin, stole the sting of death, totally took it away. He suffered upon that cross, yes, but by his death, he accomplished everything. What death did to Jesus, it's been said, is nothing compared to what Jesus did to death. And so the resurrection proves the reality of our belief. Many have claimed to come from God with a message. There have been many prophets throughout the years, but there's only one that has proved who he was by his death and resurrection. And this was the message of the first century church. Jesus died and rose again. Now, let's say we hopped on a plane today and we're going to take a tour and we're going to visit the tombs of the founders of the world's great religions. We would go to Mohammed's tomb and Buddha's tomb and Confucius' tomb and Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, and any other ones you can think of. All those tombs, friends, would be well marked, enshrined maybe with gold, precious metals, pilgrims flocking there to revere them. The difference, friends, with Christianity, Jesus' tomb is empty. Jesus' tomb is empty. In fact, it is so empty, they're not even sure which tomb is the right one. There's the famous one, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, 
of course in Jerusalem but there is claim that hey these other one this other one at least one other one looks a little bit more legitimate friends when the tomb has been empty for 2,000 years it's hard to know which one it is Jesus didn't need it for 2,000 years he only needed to borrow it for the weekend Christianity is not a philosophy about living it's a reality that has an impact upon this life now and upon life everlasting friends and what a privilege that is what a blessing it is the tomb is empty that was the message in the book of acts for the first century church now jesus declared very audaciously i am the way the truth and life no one comes to the father except through me there is no other way friends no other religion no other prophet no other road to heaven they don't all lead to heaven Jesus resurrection proves he is who he says he is and it proves the reality of our belief praise the Lord now the resurrection also provides us a new understanding of death and eternity going back to 1st Corinthians chapter 15 beginning with verse 51 we're gonna read the last verses now listen Paul says I tell you a mystery we will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of, a, of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Verse 53, for the perishable must put up, clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality. Verse 54, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ the resurrection friends provides a new understanding of death and resurrection death as I mentioned was inev in inevitable it was going to happen to us all will happen to us all no one's exempt from that Satan held us captive through fear of death and there was such hopelessness over death that I've known of individuals friends who won't even go to a funeral because they don't want to think about death they don't want to talk about death well, if that's you today, friends, there is a funeral you're going to be going to, and that's your own. You're not going to miss out on that one. But the good news is Jesus took away the sting of death. And the result is death is like a lion that can roar, but it's toothless. There's no bite left. And so death is now not an end, but a transition, we, because we have a new understanding of death and eternity. Death is something that's totally different like C.S. Lewis said if I the great uh, British author he says if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world wow isn't that beautiful friends the Bible describes death as sleep not eternal sleep it's probably more like a nap you go to bed when it's dark and that's like death and then you wake up to brilliant sunrise and the glory of a new day it's the it's new life and Paul says we may mourn when it comes to death we miss those that we that go on ahead of us but we don't mourn like those who have no hope because we have a new understanding of death and eternity friends see for those without Jesus, for those who don't have that understanding, the grave is the end. And it's, it's a place of heartbreak. And you wind up here, you look in that grave, and it's a place of eternal separation, despair, and there's no hope. But for those who know Jesus, who have this new understanding of, of death and eternity because of the resurrection, we know, friends, that we have a home in heaven. And that we're going to have a re grand reunion with loved ones and we're going to gather around the throne and worship Jesus and forever and re rejoice in, in him and throughout all eternity. Friends, when I look around this cemetery, I'm reminded that Jesus made us a promise, friends. He made you a promise. He made me a promise. Found in John 14, verse 19. He says, 
very emphatically, because I live, you shall live also. Because I live, you shall live also. You know, we have a home in heaven waiting for us, friends. When's that going to happen? I don't know. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be next month. It could be next year. It could be today. I don't know when it is, but it's coming. It's soon and very soon. And I can promise you this. When you get there in heaven, you will never want to leave. So resurrection provides a new understanding, friends, of death and eternity. And the resurrection also provides us power to live a new life. Oh, what a glorious thing that is. See, Paul says Christ gives us the victory. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When does that happen? When? Now. See, what's the difference between Christianity and every other religion? See, these ones that I mentioned, Buddhism, Hinduism, Eastern mysticism, Scientology, Mormonism, Je Jehovah Witness. Their goal is admirable. It's really probably the same from all of them. Peace, harmony, joy, love, whatever it might be for all eternity. The difference is those religions require extraordinary efforts, friends. You work, you strive, you spend your entire life and you die not knowing if what you did was good enough. You die hoping that what you did was enough. It's been described that the difference between Christianity and every other religion is the difference between do and done. All other religions do, do this, do that, do the other thing. But for Christianity, it, the word is done. Jesus accomplished everything at the cross. He declared, it is finished. And then he rose again to make that, to show that truth. What a blessing that is. So I have a question for you. What is the one requirement for true Christianity? What is the one requirement for true, Christi true Christianity? You know, to become a child of God. Does it mean do you attend church? You read the Bible, you give your money, you do a good deed, you live a good life, you live a righteous life. All those things are great. But the only requirement, friends, to become a child of God is to recognize that you can't do it you have a complete inability to live the Christian life. But because Jesus declared, it is finished, it's done. And then he rose again from the dead to prove that what he, what he did was, was, was accomplished. See, he's alive and you can let Jesus live his life in you. He's not in a grave somewhere over in Jerusalem for the last 2,000 years. He's alive with you today. He's the only one that can live the Christian life in your life. And that's all because of the resurrection. Amen. So it provides power for living today. The resurrection does. And number four, the resurrection proclaims new hope for today. New hope for today. It's not just pie in the sky, friends. It's not just something for tomorrow, but there's a new hope for today. There's a glorious reality for today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul says this, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Wow. Now that verse is a great verse, but for years I thought, wow, it seems out of place. It seems really strange. It seems 1 Corinthians 15 should end with verse 57 that you know, God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's won, he's resurrected, he's won the battle, and, and that's it. But there's great practical application for that verse, because when you find out, when you see it, therefore, you got to find out what it's there for. And so, therefore, Paul is saying, as a result of Christ's resurrection from the dead, that that makes a difference in our life, because he was resurrected physically, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we are resurrected spiritually. That's salvation. And then when we die, we're going to have physical resurrection and we're going to be with him forever and throughout all eternity in heaven. But it makes a difference for today, our Christian living today. See, Christ's death is, and his resurrection, his victory over death, hell, and the grave means he can conquer anything. He can conquer 
everything. And living in you, that power is available and that hope is available for you to face whatever you need to face. See, and you can stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, this is not a carrot and stick. It's not great inner motivation. It's not a positive mental attitude, friends. If Jesus can defeat death and the grave, overcome all the work of hell and sin, then that means he can conquer the devastation of hopelessness and let you live in glorious hope. Now, that's not a wish. It's not a desire. It's not a longing, but it's an anticipation. It's an expectation, friends. It's a certainty. It's an assurance. It's an assurance, a confidence. So if you're feeling discouraged, you feel disheartened, you defeated, feel defeated, friends, live in hope. Never, never, never give up. Jesus, Christianity, the church is not just here to help you get by week to week so you can somehow make it through the next seven days or the next number of weeks or months or years. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, is available to help you be victorious, friends. You're not in this life just to survive. You're here to thrive. Jesus said, I'm going to make you an overcomer. You're a winner. You're a champion. Friends, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us so. Hallelujah. Friends, Jesus is alive in 2020. And nothing can take away from that. Not this coronavirus pandemic we're experiencing now. It's kind of throwing a lot of things upside down. I understand that. But that can't stand in the way of Jesus. And whatever seas there might be, cancer or chaos or crisis or catastrophe, financial crisis, economic catastrophe, employment catastrophe, whatever it is, friends, we don't live by that. We celebrate instead the victory and power of Jesus over death and that his resurrection proves the reality of our belief it provides a new understanding of death and eternity. It gives us power to live a new life and proclaims a new hope for us for today, every day. Let me share a short story in closing. Charles Maurice de Talleyrand was a French um, diplomat. In fact, one of the most famous diplomats in European history. He lived during the time, about the time of the French Revolution. And the story is told that a man was trying to start a new religion. And he came to Talleyrand and complained he could not make any converts. And he asked Talleyrand, he said, what do you suggest I should do? Talleyrand replied, I should recommend that you get yourself crucified and then die. But be sure to rise again the third day. <laughs> the resurrection, friends, changes everything. Amen. Are you ready? To ready to live in the victory of the resurrection? Ready to live in the reality of new life in Christ that happens now? And that this grave here, this cemetery or wherever you're uh, uh, planning to be buried, should the time happen, that's not going to be the end, but the end is going to be in heaven. And that we can live now with joy and live forever with Jesus because the resurrection changes everything. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, I rejoice in you. I thank you that you raised your son from the life, into life, from death into life, Lord. And that, as a result of that, it makes such a difference in our life. And I pray, Lord, that if there are men, women, young people, boys and girls listening to this, and their hearts are being stirred by the Holy Spirit. They would say yes to you. I want this Jesus to be Lord of my life. I want the resurrected Christ to make that difference in my life, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Resurrection Day, friends. God bless you. God love you. Aloha keakua. Bye-bye.